the world of oil, Monday the 4th of April 2011, by Noam Chomsky. Last month, at the International Tribunal of Crimes during the Civil War in Sierra Leone, the trial of former Liberian President Charles Taylor came to an end. The Chief Prosecutor, United States Law Professor David Crane, informed the Times of London that the case was incomplete. The prosecutors intended to charge Muammar Gaddafi, who Crane said was ultimately responsible for the mutilation, maiming and or murder of 1.2 million people. But the charge was not to be. The United States, United Kingdom and others intervened to block it. Asked why Crane said, welcome to the world of oil. Another recent Gaddafi casualty was Sir Howard Davis, the director of the London School of Economics who resigned after revelation of the school's link to the Libyan dictator. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, the Monitor Group of Consultancy Firm founded by Harvard professors was well paid for such services as a book to bring Gaddafi's immortal words to the public in conversation with renowned international experts, along with other efforts to enhance international appreciation of Gaddafi's Libya. The world of oil is rarely far in the background in affairs concerning this region. For example, as the dimensions of the United States defeat in Iraq could no longer be concealed, pretty rhetoric was displayed by honest announcements of policy goals. In November 2007, the White House issued a declaration of principles insisting that Iraq must grant indefinite taxes and privilege to American investors. Two months later, President Bush informed Congress that he would reject legislation that might limit the permanent extensioning of United States armed forces in Iraq or, quote, United States control of the oil resources of Iraq, unquote, demands that the United States had to abandon shortly afterward in the face of Iraqi resistance. The world of oil provides useful guidance for Western reactions to the remarkable democracy uprising in the Arab world. An oil-rich dictator who is a reliable client is granted virtual free reign. There was little reaction when Saudi Arabia declared on March 5th, quote, laws and regulation in the kingdom totally prohibit all kinds of demonstrations, marches and sitting protests, as well as calling for them as they go against the principles of Sharia and Saudi customs and traditions, unquote. The kingdom mobilized huge security forces. They rigorously enforced the ban. In Kuwait, small demonstrations were crushed. The male fist struck in Bahrain after Saudi-led military forces intervened to ensure that the minority Sunni monarchy would not be threatened by calls for democratic reforms. Bahrain is sensitive not only because it hosts the United States' fifth fleet, but also because it borders Shiite areas of Saudi Arabia, the location of most of the kingdom's oil. The world's primary energy resources happen to be located near the northern Persian Gulf, or Arabian Gulf as Arabs often call it, largely see it a potential nightmare for Western planners. In Egypt and Tunisia, the popular uprising has won impressive victories, but as the Carnage Endowment reported, the regimes remain and are seemingly determined to curb the pro-democracy momentum generated so far. A change in ruling elites and system of governance is still a distant goal, and one that the West will seek to keep far removed. Libya is a different case, an old rich state run by a brutal dictator who, however, is unreliable. A dependable client would be far preferable. When non-violent protests erupted, Gaddafi moved quickly to crush them. On March 22nd, as Gaddafi's forces were converging on the rebel capital of Benghazi, Top Obama Middle East advisor Dennis Ross warned that if there is a massacre, everyone would blame us for it, an unacceptable consequence. 
In the West certainly didn't want Gaddafi to enhance his power and independence by crushing the rebellion. The United States joined in the United Nations Security Council authorization of a no-fly zone to be implemented by France, the United Kingdom and the United States. The intervention prevented a likely massacre, but was interpreted by the coalition as authorizing direct support for the rebels. A ceasefire was imposed on Gaddafi's forces, but the rebels were helped to advance to the west. In short order, they conquered the major sources of Libya's oil production, at least temporarily. On March 28th, London-based Arab journal Al Quds Al Arabi warned that the intervention may leave Libya with two states, a rebel-held oil-rich east and a poverty-stricken Gaddafi-led west. Given that the oil wells have been secured, we may find ourselves facing a new Libyan oil emirate, sparsely inhabited, protected by the west and very similar to the Gulf Emirates states. Or the western-backed rebellion might proceed all the way to eliminate the Eurytanian dictator. It is commonly argued that oil cannot be a motive for the intervention because the West had access to the prize under Gaddafi. True but irrelevant. The same could be said about Iraq under Saddam Hussein or Iran and Cuba today. What the West seeks is what Bush announced, control or at least dependable clients and in the case of Libya access to vast unexplored areas expected to be rich in oil. United States and British internal documents stress that the virus of nationalism is the greatest fear, since it might breed disobedience. The intervention is being conducted by the three traditional imperial powers, though we may recall Libyans presumably do that after World War I Italy conducted genocide in eastern Libya. The Western powers are acting in virtual isolation. States in the region Turkey and Egypt want no part of it, nor does Africa. The Gulf dictator would be happy to see Gaddafi gone, but even if they are groaning under the weight of advanced weapons provided to them to recycle petrodollars and ensure obedience, they barely offer more than token participation. The same is true beyond India, Brazil and even Germany. The Arab Spring has deep roots. The region has been simmering for years. The first of the current wave of protests began last year in Western Sahara, the last African colony invaded by Morocco in 1975 and illegally held since, in a manner similar to East Timor and the Iraqi occupied territories. A non-violent protest last November was crushed by Moroccan forces. France intervened to block a Security Council inquiry into the crimes of its client. Then a flame ignited in Tunisia that has since spread into conflagration. Mm -hmm.